Hey, this is Dave Nillette. I'm so glad that you're interested in our Seeing Jesus More Clearly Bible Studies. There is always something good going on here. If you want to learn more about the ministry, you can do so. Go into our website, bygraceinternational.com, and maybe you want to support what we're doing financially. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can go there as well, bygraceinternational.com slash give. Thanks. You know, last week we spoke of the uh, the season of Advent, how we're in the first week of this this Advent time, and that really it's 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 a season of waiting. It's uh, a season of of being hopeful, of anticipating, of of preparing ourselves, our hearts, our our, our spirits, our minds for celebrating the arrival of the Christ. You know, that's what that word Advent means. It's It, it just simply means arrival. You know, we use it all the time uh, outside of the religious connotations. You know, uh, we say things like it's the, the advent of the information age and all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, and, and so really this, this arrival of Jesus, you know, if we truly... Um, examine it as believers it's it's really the the beginning of the uh the seminal act the, the act that changes everything as far as humanity is concerned right you know this is this is the the end of the end stages you know you have now entered the end game this is the the last phase before jesus is to be offered up on the cross crucified by uh, you know the, the the Romans, the human powers. Um, you know our, our own uh, uh, our own systemic need for violence that that held him there on the cross as he bore the weight of our sin. And we said the other week that it's not. You know uh, we we quoted Brian, Pastor Brian Zahn and that the cross is not what God inflicts on Christ in order to forgive. It's what God endu- God as Christ endures while He forgives, as He forgives. And, and so this is really the the beginning stages of it is what we're, we're celebrating, we're, we're waiting for it. And so we spoke last week of this, you know, how must the Jewish people have felt in this time, waiting for the Messiah to come, waiting for the prophesied king to arrive. You know, they'd been in exile all these years, and, uh, you know, that there hadn't, hadn't been a king on the throne of David for, for quite some time, and yet, and yet, the Messiah was still due to come. And, and so, you know, if we're waiting for the Messiah to come, you know, this begs the question, what exactly are we waiting for? What do we need to be watching for? What do we need to be looking for? And that's what this, uh, the, the next step, the next week here uh, in this Advent season is. We're, we're looking for the signs, right? You know, Jesus talks about um, that, you know, many will come, you know, saying, I, I am the Christ and don't believe them. You know, I, I haven't come back yet. Um and he's referring, you know, a, a lot of times we've we've taken this in our uh, our Western church world, our Western church eyes here, you know, within the last 200 or so years, and, and sort of built um, a, a rapture, end times, theological framework around it. When in reality, if you go and, you know, Jesus, regardless of your eschatology, may have been referring to that, may not have been, um, but... Jesus is, is speaking specifically to in the time between when I leave and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in the year 70. Um, there will be people claiming to be the Messiah, to be the Christ, to be the, to, to be the Savior, and, and don't follow them, don't believe them, because, you know, for those who did, uh, many of them were, were, were put to death. There was, there was a whole host of things that occurred there, you know, and we could we could spend time going into, you know, Matthew, I believe it's 24 and, and those other prophecies there. But, uh, you know, th- th- that's what Jesus is saying. You need to be watchful because, uh, you, you need to be looking for me for, for these signs. So, you know, we really want to look at, uh, what are the signs? What are we waiting for? You know, these would have been the things that would have been in the, the hearts and the minds of the Jewish people as they're waiting, as they're pondering, as they're questioning, will the Messiah ever make it? You know, these would be the things they'd refer to. And, and let's look over um, at the book of Isaiah, if you will, Isaiah chapter 11. And, and we'll start off here, um, you, you know, and it's, I actually learned this this week, you know, been a Christian my whole life and just learning new things about the Bible still. But um, I, I learned that, you know, it, essentially we can look at Isaiah as as like a mini um a, a mini 
Bible. Uh, it's referred to as the proto gospel by some people because there's so much there uh, about the the Jewish uh, or the messianic prophecies regarding Jesus, regarding his his coming to the earth, regarding these things. Um, you know, and it, it's broken up into into all these different sections that parallel with the Bible. I won't go into it, but it's it's interesting. But as I, Isaiah 11, 1, uh, this is this is one of these messianic prophecies here, and it says, "A shoot shall come out." From the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness. He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp. Got to be careful saying that word. <laughs> and the, uh, the wean child shall put its hand in the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. So Isaiah is speaking here of the coming Messiah. And, and you know, um, we, we, we want to be uh, careful here when we read the prophets because, um, you, you know, there's a, there's a temptation that we have to take certain things literally in Scripture uh, and not others, you know, uh, when Jesus tells the rich young ruler to sell all you have and follow me for, for some reason, we don't seem to think that that is, uh, you know, that's not literal. He was talking to one person in one specific instance, but when it talks about, you know, a prophecy about Jesus killing people here, um, you know, well, that's, you know, uh, you know, that is literal, is what people think. You know, they think that Jesus has come and, and, and his judgment that he's going to enact, Jesus is going to come and he came as the, as the lamb once, but he's going to come back as the lion and rain down hellfire and brimstone and all, the, you, you know, all these kinds of things. But what we have to understand is that the prophets, uh, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, but the prophets in particular, were not specifically interested in arguing uh, or, or discussing absolute truth. The, the, the prophets, the gospel writers in the same vein were, uh, I, I believe the phrase I heard used is theological artists. They were poets. So, so, you know, you, you know, when we write a, when somebody writes a song, right. Or, uh, a, a poem, a work of art, a, 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 you know, a piece of prose, whatever it might be, that not all the language in that is to be taken literally. We're using language to uh, to establish something, right? We're using language to paint a picture, to convey an idea. And, and so the idea being conveyed here by the prophet is that yes, you know, the these um, you know, the spirit of the Lord will, will rest on him, be wise, he'll he'll have understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. Um, he's gonna delight in in the Lord. But look at verse four again. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor, shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Now, we, we see that and we say, you see, Jesus is coming to, to demand and enact vengeance on all those who are opposed to him. Well, is that really what, what he's saying here? Does that line up with the person and the character of Jesus that we see expressed, that we see lived throughout the scriptures? that we see throughout the Gospels. Is this the Jesus? No, Jesus, th this isn't, <laughs> Jesus isn't there to, 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 to kill people. I, I mean, he, he tells his disciples to, you know, sell your coat and buy a sword. And they, uh, you know, they come up with two swords before he's betrayed. And uh, he says, well, that's enough. And uh, the, the, the verse says that he only told them to get the swords so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, that he was numbered with the transgressors. In fact, when Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off the, the high priest's servant's ear, what does Jesus do? He pulls a Yoda, you know, away, put your weapon, I mean you no harm. Like, uh, Peter, put your sword away. What are you doing? What are you doing, man? Those who live by the sword die by the sword. 
Well, for somebody who's here to, to kill the wicked with the breath of his lips, he sure isn't interested in killing anybody. So this has to be poetic language. You know, um, when, when we talk about the, the wicked here, uh, is he referring to uh, people being wicked? Or could it be wickedness as, as a concept, the, the ideal of wickedness, uh, the, the, the representation, um, uh, wickedness and, and its impacts on the earth will forever be no more, you know, at, at his breath. You know, there, there's things to think about and to ponder here. Uh, it's not necessarily speaking of, of Jesus coming with a sword to, to murder somebody, though. Um, you know, and then he's going to be righteous and faithful, and it goes into the wolf living with the lamb and, you know, all, all these different uh, words that we're familiar with. Um, but we, we don't really necessarily take them to heart either uh, because, you know, when, when, when you begin to talk about Jesus and and the uh, historical call that many Christians feel towards Christian pacifism or, or you know, uh, towards that. I heard, I heard somebody say that um, I, I'm not a Christian pacifist, but I aspire to be. I aspire to be because my inclination is to respond with violence, but Jesus shows me a higher way, a better way. The Jesus who, who talks about, you know, at once, once the kingdom is fully uh, come, we'll beat our swords into plowshares. We're, we're going to be done with our weapons. We're not going to, uh, there's an old, I believe it's a, an African-American spiritual song, um, you know, we're going to war no more. So this is the idea it's presenting here that uh, once, once the Messiah has come, once the Messiah has arrived, truly we will war no more. That, that, that peace will come and flood the earth. The knowledge of God will cover the whole earth. The knowledge of, of the grace, the mercy, the love, the peace of God will cover the earth like the water, the sea. Let's look over at the book of Psalms here. And this is, these, these are all just readings from uh, the lectionary, which I, I told you guys about the other week. Um, you know, these are the traditional readings in, uh, the, there's, there's three years, uh, in the year, I believe it's year I think it's your C, it might be your A. Um, but in, in the years leading up to, uh, you know, every year goes through different ones, but but in the time leading up to um, Christmas and, and, and all of this. So um, th- these are just the traditional readings from the scripture, from the church calendar. Uh, Psalm 72, 1, give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Notice that this isn't the focus of our message today, but this is now the second messianic prophecy where we see uh, poor people receiving justice. A lot of times we want to think of justice being something negative, but you know, if we believe that poverty uh, it is a curse. You know, the Bible, you know, shows that it's under the curse of the law, that poverty was never God's plan for humanity, that, that, you know, we were designed to live in the garden, to live in, in, in Eden with God forever. Justice would be to set right the systems of oppression that make people poor. That's why when Jesus spoke to Zacchaeus, we spoke about this the other week, um, he, he spoke to Zacchaeus and uh, Zacchaeus was just, was just compelled. He said, Lord, I'm going to pay everybody, you know, everybody back. And if I've stolen unjustly from somebody, I'll pay him back fourfold. It's why Jesus told the rich young ruler who, who, who held his money close to him to, to give away all you have, sell it, give it to the poor. You see, it's, 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 it's not the Messiah is going to come and the Messiah is going to deal with the systems of oppression that hold people in bondage, with the systems of oppression that keep people bound. These are the messianic prophecies here. Uh, 72.3, may the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy and crush, crush the oppressor. Now, again, we, we, we spoke, uh, you know, the, the nonviolence here of Jesus, but uh, I, I think it's important to note that when it comes down to it, there's, there's, uh, there's a famous quote by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King where he said that essentially, and I'm, I'm going to badly butcher it and paraphrase it, but essentially he said that, um, that there is, when, when it comes to issues of injustice, there is no neutrality. You're, you're, you're either for 
the marginalized and the oppressor. You're on the side of the oppressor. And Jesus is, you know, this is clearly uh, shown that Jesus is on the side of the marginalized. Jesus is on the side of the oppressed. Jesus is on the side of the downcast, the downtrodden. Those who think that they can't do anything uh, in society, Jesus is taking up on their side. And yet so many of us in the church have taken up to, to perpetuate the very systems that keep people in bondage. That is a message uh, for another day. Uh, 72.5, may he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. You know, this is signifying, again, we spoke of, remember, this is, this is poetry here. This is speaking of his reign will be eternal forever. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. Until, I mean, this whole thing's going to burn up and go somewhere. But let his righteousness abound. Jump on down to verse 18. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. Wow. You, you see, this is, this is the, same, uh, the same picture being painted here by the, by the psalmist of the coming Messiah. This is the same picture that's being painted. And so when, when we see this picture being painted that Jesus is going to come, the Messiah is going to come, he's going to take up for the outcast, for the poor, for the marginalized, for those on the outcurse, those kicked out by polite society. When we see that being the case... This begins to orient ourselves for who Jesus will be like. He won't be one of the religious elites. You know, I had a comment um, on uh, one, of our, one of our videos the other week when we were speaking of uh, people being enemies and things like that and how, how as Christians, as believers, uh, Christ never called us to make enemies of anybody. And uh, I had a, a wonderful uh, sister in Christ comment on it um, about how Jesus told off the Pharisees and, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to tell people the truth or else, you know. And, and I just sat there and I thought for a second. Um, I said, well... You know, the people that Jesus called out were those who were using religion to perpetuate injustice, those who were using religion to oppress, those who were using religion to criticize, to, to condemn, to hold things against people. So, I mean, if those are the people you want to speak against, uh, go for it. But really what it means is people who don't live the way that I think they ought to live. And so, you know, then she says, well, their blood will be on our, on our heads. Well, you know, if Jesus bore the weight of, of all the sin of the world, and we believe he did as, as Christians, uh, what is there left for you and I to bear? What is there left for us to take? What is there left for us to hold on to? If, if we truly believe that Jesus bore the price of the sin of humanity, What, what, what are we doing here? And beyond that, Jesus' entire mission on the earth was, you know, he, he's looking for who can I include? He went and sought out the tax collectors. At the Last Supper, he had Judas sit with him at the table. Judas, right? The, uh, the one who will betray me. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus fed him the body, the blood at the Last Supper. Jesus, or Judas took part in it. Jesus knew he was about to be uh, figuratively stabbed in the back by Judas, and yet, and yet, he still showed him love, still showed him grace, still showed him compassion. The only people that Jesus had a problem with were those who, who, who used the name of God to oppress people. And so if that's you and I using the name of God to oppress people, uh, to, to enforce, you know, what our convictions, you know, what your convictions might be or my convictions might be on somebody who doesn't share those same convictions, to, to force people to bear weights that they were never meant or designed or, or created to bear and to carry, what are we doing? Jesus said, come to me all who, you know, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'm meek and lowly in heart. My, my burden is easy. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light, right? This is, this is Jesus we're talking about. This is how he is. So, so again, we're seeing this theme that Jesus is going to be taking up on the side of those who have been beaten down by society. Let's look over at Matthew 3, and this will be our last passage here. Matthew 3, verse 1. Uh, in those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now we need to stop here and deal with this word, repent. You know, we've spoken of it before, uh, but so many people think that repentance is, I've got to feel bad for myself. I've got to feel sorry for myself. Oh, woe is me. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. I, I'm so, uh. come on, man. Let's, let's, let's look at what the word means. Metanoia. Uh, in the Greek, and we, we, we won't look it up for the sake of time, but it means a change of mind. A change of mind then leads to a change of action. Okay, so if, if that's what it means, okay, I, I'm gonna repent, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna change my mind about what I've been doing, and now I'm gonna go do something else. It, it, it's not that difficult, right? I, I mean, if I, can, if I can figure it out, well, what do you want for dinner tonight? Well, you know, I think maybe we'll go get some Mexican food Hey, you know what? On second thought, uh, you know, I repent of that. Let's have, let's have pizza instead. Uh, I, I changed my mind. It led to a change of action, right? Do you see how it works? This is, this, is the, this is the message of John. Stop thinking about the world in the same way you've been thinking about it because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready to change your mind. The Messiah is here. He's coming. He's on the way. He, he is, I, I mean, the time is just about now. Verse three. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And you know, uh, if you grew up in, in the evangelical church in the 90s and 2000s, I'm sure Jesus Freak goes through uh, your head every time you read that verse, right? That song, um, you know, uh, but, but locusts and wild honey doesn't really seem to be the most balanced diet to me, but you know... Um, Neither here nor there. Uh, verse five. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. You know, this is my dad. <laughs> my dad used to pastor. This was, uh, this was one of his favorite expressions in scripture. You brood of vipers. You know, you, you, you group of snakes. You guys are just out here trying to do all this, that, and the other. And, you know, um, it, 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 uh, it reminds me of, you know, some other uh, colloquial expressions we have um, that, that refer to heredity in animals. You know, you, you sons of, and you can finish the rest. Uh, you know, but this is what he's saying. Are you brood of vipers? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Notice that he doesn't stop with who warned you. you. You don't have anywhere to go. He says you need to bear fruit worthy of repentance. What is the fruit worthy of repentance? Well, the, the changed heart leads to a changed mind. The fruit worthy of it would be I'm now going to act out those changes. I'm going to live. I'm going to stop using my, my religious beliefs to oppress those around me, to, to, to hold people in chains that are uh, bondage that's too heavy for them to bear. Do not presume to say to yourselves, look at this, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able to raise, from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. You see, don't, don't lean on your natural. Don't lean on your natural inclination. Don't, don't lean on your natural lineage, your, natu uh, your natural heritage to say, well, yes, Abraham is our, is our, is our father. Uh, so, so we're good. You know, we got, we got our, our, our Abraham generational card. It's, it's stamped and we're ready to go. Uh, you know, a lot of Christians, a lot of people do this in America too. Uh, you ask somebody, well, you know, are you a Christian? And people, there's a number of people who say, well, shoot, yeah, I'm an American, aren't I? You know, for, for many people, they view those two as synonymous. Um, but, but don't presume to say, uh, I'm a Christian because I was born an American. Uh, because God's able from these stones to raise up Christians. <laughs> you know, that'll preach. Um, but uh, Verse 10, even now the ax is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree does not bear good fruit is cut down. And it's thrown into the fire. Now, what, what is he talking about when he says the axe is laid to the root of the tree? Uh, these, these systems that do not lead to this fruit worthy of repentance. He's not referring to people being cast in the fire. He's talking about these, these systems of, of oppression, of, of holding people bound and captive uh, in, this, in this religious fervor and fear of the unknown, of the future, of all these things, uh, of, of you know mistakenly stepping out of line. He says that it's time for those systems, for those trees, their root systems, everything to come down and be cast into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is coming or one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. 
He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So these systems are being torn down. And now there's coming one who will show you the truth. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he'll clear his threshing floor, and he will gather wheat into the granary, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. And, and, and so, you know, this is, this, this is what we see over and over again, um, is that this, this voice crying out, this voice crying out for peace, this voice crying out for justice, crying out for justice on the side of, for the sake of, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the cast down, the beaten up in society, that one is the one who is coming. So be on the lookout for him. Be on the lookout for him. Uh, you, he, he's the one who's gonna come. Don't, don't trust in your own family line to save you. As we're waiting for the Messiah, be looking for, for, for the Messiah to come. Look for these signs, because when you see them, that's where we put our trust. And you see, that, that's, that's what this, you know, this, um, you know, this season is, is about. We're, we're, we're waiting. We're anticipating the Messiah. So we, we've, we've gone through this, this, this longing in the first week, and, and now we're building our expectation. We're seeing what, what are the signs to look for. What are the things to, to see about the arrival of the Messiah. And, and, and when we see him come, how does this change us? Amen. And, you know, I, I hope you enjoyed it. You know, uh, if you do, go ahead, give us a like. You can subscribe on our channel. Go to our website, uh, bygraceinternational.com. If you want to support us, you can do it there as well, bygraceinternational.com slash give. And we'll be back next week with our third week in our Advent series. And uh, have a blessed week. We'll see you then.